and that was Crosby, Stills, Nash. Uh, Teach Children Well, which I chose for my guest today, uh, Associate Dean of uh, for Academic Affairs, Dr. Eric Hoffman, who's on to uh, discuss the completion of his dissertation, which was entitled, Everyone is a Case Study, the Learning Foundation of Academic Careers in a Community College, earning a earning his doctor of education with a concentration in curriculum. Uh, curriculum. <laughs> Actually, I have something in the, in the way here, but I think teaching, learning, and leadership in the School of Education at Northeastern University. Mm, that was a mouthful. Welcome, Eric. Or should I say Dr. Hi. Hoffman? You should say Eric. Say Hi, Hugo. <laughs> Good. And we had a, we were talking before the show. Eric knows that uh, in incarnations past, uh, I used to ask my guests if they had any anything in particular they would like me to play, and uh, that went away when when we first started doing what's going on. I did all these manifestations of the the classic Marvin Gaye song, and then ever since then I, I ran out of those, and I've been picking things. What, what would you, what would you have chosen, Eric, if you could have picked something for the show musically, just off the top of your head? Um. <laughs> Uh, I would do another version of what's going on by Four Non Blonde. Okay. No, no take. I, I guess maybe I should start that that policy again because you're right. It does give a little flavor to the show, uh, tailors the show for our guests. Uh, by the way, I also wanted to, to do give you a public apology because when uh, when when we started ag again uh, with opening sessions, I don't know if it was this spring or it was in the fall. I was running around campus with uh, my earbuds in that my wife had bought me listening to a union meeting and you were trying to engage me face to face in a welcome back and I was still in the virtual world. I think I did that to you and I did that to Dr. Arcario and I've spent, you know, like the rest of the year or semester uh, in self-loathing as a result of it. And uh, so I just wanted to apologize for that. No, that's fine. I, I, I knew what you were doing. You told me. Well, yeah, and you told Paul too because Paul was like, he's trying to say hello to me, and, and Eric's like, oh, he's in a union meeting. Just, just you know, walk away. It's like, Chi yeah, forget about it. It's Chinatown. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I don't know about anybody else. I'm still trying to figure out how to negotiate this face-to-face -face and online thing. And uh, though all my classes are face-to-face, -face, almost every meeting I have is online. So that's yeah, peculiar. It's hard. I, it's hard for me to know I'm going to be remote what to put in my bag, when to even take my bag home, and what's right. sitting in my office at home, and what's Well, here. actually, today, for example, I had an, had an 8 o'clock meeting in at home, and then I was going to have to get in on the train and be at the college for an event that's going on right now, that, or just, may, may have just finished. The president had a luncheon for the folks of the Hispanic Heritage Center, uh, El Centro, that they've created, and... Uh, I figured out I had to get on. I had to wake up at three to be on a five o'clock train to be at the college by eight, and then kick around. And I just said, N -n -n "I can't do this. I've done I've done it before, but I can't." So, uh, and I wanted to be here for you, of course. I wanted to be a hundred percent for you. <laughs> Thank you. I feel the same. <laughs> You're always a hundred percent. So, so let's talk about this because the last time, you know, and I and I was thinking about this too that you had been on the show talking about this process and before you know everything but orals right what is that uh, uh, uh everything uh, ob uh, abd yeah that ABD. was everything but the all but the dissertation right abd right yeah. and so we had talked about about this then uh but you know now that it is final you've gone through through that process and congratulations uh i wanted to check in again and and just see you know kind of see what came of it for you so how 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 were orals by the way <laughs> how was that experience um so different as you know every school has something different so my orals were actually um being i didn't have it like folks in a phd program for example i had to defend my proposal that was last summer um and i can talk a little bit about the methodology which is action research and it has cycles of data collection and reflection and it has an, um, action steps. And so um, I had my first cycle of data collection 
uh, was uh, fall of 2021, and I had to write that up. And I was also taking courses at the same time. This work, I wrote my proposal for my second cycle of um, data collection. These are the action steps. And really, it's framed around kind of a problem of practice at my work, work site. Um, so that's when I was defending the program. And I moved into the action steps this past fall, where I worked with some of our colleagues, faculty, and staff to design a tool to help uh, address this problem of practice. And I can go into a little bit more about that. But the focus of my research was on kind of the, the tenure track position at a community college specifically and the challenges that faculty face um, when they start a, a tenure track and the kind of the way that they balance all of their responsibilities, how they understand their role. Um, and I was also interested because of my role at the college in ship of their work to the kinds of professional development or educational development uh, opportunities that they have and how they find ways to integrate all of this um, along the way. So um, what I was defending was my plan for working with colleagues to create some kind of tool, which is a website. We use an e-portfolio platform to do it that would help new faculty kind of reflect on um, where they're starting and give them some space uh, during the year and over subsequent years to document the work they're doing, plan ahead, and maybe share that with their chairs or mentors um, to get feedback as they're moving along this seven-year timeline. You know, it's it's yeah. funny because uh, I, th I think at one point, I don't know where, where it was in the practice, where I had this notion of like, imagine if faculty, you know, presented their you know, this this report that we all work on uh, in conjunction with the chair every year. What if we just did it through an e-portfolio? And, you know, I got a lot of blowback about that <laughs> because, you know, there are those folks who who don't engage with e-portfolio and would be, you know, uh, at a disadvantage of uh, that. But but when you were talking about it, I realized that one really good thing about doing it through e-portfolio is what happens. So, you know, we write these things in the fall. And it's, you know, it's a bit of an ordeal, you know, it's usually a lot of times starting the summer and then it, uh, it ends at whenever it is that your chair brings you forward. Uh, you know, as you get, uh, you know, farther and farther in the process, your presentation is earlier and earlier. And then what happens again is that whether it's in late spring or some mid summer, you have to start it again. And you're like, <laughs> where is all that paperwork you've been working on? Uh, I mean, as I've said in these, uh, you know, when the faculty council puts on those events for uh, faculty who are working through the process, I've, you know, we tell them, you know, you should be saving stuff. You should be basically writing the thing all year long, like have a have a document where you're yeah. literally where you're documenting what you're doing as you go, as opposed to trying to cull all this stuff in the first weeks of September or whenever it is that you find yourself doing it. So the e-portfolio would actually be a great repository for these materials, right? Yeah, and that was part of it. So um, the the second cycle, this, this design team around this tool, there were six faculty, all who have, as a co-facilitator, uh, a CTL seminar or a mini grant or something at some point, and a couple of um, senior uh, CTL staff. And we talked about those things, you know, how do you keep track of it all, especially when you're starting out? How do you document it? Um, some folks uh, had mentors who gave them the heads up when they started and said, oh, this is something you'll want to make sure you do. I think one had a mentor them to save everything. Um, but where do you put that? And then ties all of that into this more formal 10 page document uh, right. that you're going to write up and then how and, and what's the relationship between that document and what you're going to write next year so there's just a lot of moving parts and i think that um especially for faculty who have a higher teaching load than you know our colleagues at the four years um, and our faculty who are because of the ratio of full-time to adjunct faculty to here are probably risk um, than you might have at the four year. There's just a lot to keep track of. Yeah, when, and when you were talking about that, I think one of the things that people 
always struggle to keep track of is what promises have you made? You know, that last little section where you're basically talking about your goals for the following year. And, you know, you have some things are, you know, obviously, you know, when it comes to your pedagogy, there are certain things you're going to and you're applying them in the classes, but all kinds of other things that you could throw in there. I know that historically, most people usually actually make too many promises of things they're going to, which is one of the things that people that uh, makes them struggle, but keeping track of your goals and making sure that you actually are engaged in them in a timely manner, as opposed to, let's say, May. (laughs) Speaking from experience there? Well, I mean, it's, you know, it it is, it, it, Let's put it this way: It's pretty bad if you if you have to ask, "What did I say I was going to do?" <laughs> Where is that but. document? Right. I think the other thing that makes it tricky. Um, so everyone here is basically bound. The faculty on the tenure track line are bound to the CUNY rules um, and these different categories. And I think the question. I know this is something that has been swirling and circulating. Since I've been in the college, I, I'm just coming up and finishing my sixth year here, and um, it's this question about leadership. And you know, I used as part of my problem of practice. I, I talked about the, the results from coach survey, the two iterations of that, um, and, and figuring out like what am I supposed to be doing toward leadership, and when do I do that, and should I be putting myself up in the fourth year? You know, this old do I move to the associate before? And I just think those are a lot of questions where. It's an individual question, and there's probably for some people a little bit of pressure or an internal pressure. Maybe on that, and I think that it's hard to think about that piece when you're just starting, if, especially if you hadn't been at LaGuardia for that. So there's just so much that happens in those first couple of years. I just think it's really hard to. The other thing that a portfolio would let us do. It doesn't have to be in a course on their own. It's kind of reflect on that transition to college and, and into a community college. There's a lot that happens here. Um, I was looking at adult learning theory, some of the um, foundation, the knowledge foundation for this. And, you know, like chance happens when you find yourself moving, you know, for those of our, uh, our colleagues who came out of doc, okay, I was an expert and now I need to be an innovator. Or I need to learn this whole new area. It's like all of the, like, what are the college goals? What are the initiatives here? What are the goals? So I just think that there's a lot that's happening in that space for someone to really embrace what it means to be at this college, what our sort of philosophy is, I guess, you know, the ethos of LaGuardia as your responsibilities. Learn who our students are. At the time, you know, it just changed recently, but 27, you know, course hours like balancing all of that uh, just well, we're down to 24 now we're yeah, down, to, it's 24. down to 24 now yeah and I, I talked about that um it's that shifts you know the rules um around going for associate have shifted in the time since i've started um my research so it's just hard i think for people to keep track of all of that and having something like a portfolio i think could help them um, kind of keep track of it themselves, but also find a way to bring it all together. Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting because, I mean, there's a couple of things that we could talk about, which is, you know, LaGuardia as as a community college, would you say we are the average community college? Because, you know, I, my, my, my understanding was that Gail's goal was to really pump up the scholarship piece and so people who came to teach, who saw themselves as uh, focusing on their teaching, were kind of put, you know, uh, uh, kind of trying to scramble for the scholarship piece of, of publishing uh, in their fields, I guess. Though I, I know many of them publish in the area of, of pedagogy as uh, in teaching. Uh, and then, of course, when, when Paul was provost and as president, he brought up the piece of leadership. So now we've got a teaching, we got a, a, you know, community colleges, which most people think of as we're supposed to be focused on the teaching and the scholarship was elevated. And then this leadership piece came in. Is that, is that typical or is LaGuardia unique in that sense that, uh, 
there, mm-hmm. there's so much emphasis played on the, that was placed on these three areas. Um, that's actually in the CUNY bylaws. I mean, that's actually part of all faculty at CUNY are um, evaluated on those categories. I'll, I'll say a little bit about leadership, but scholarship, um, I'll call it advising, your teaching, your college and departmental contributions, collegiality. Um, those are all built in, in in every department across CUNY. Those are supposed to be the criteria that are used. Leadership, according to CUNY, is something that is um, evaluated for promotion to associate. So um, I, I can't tell you what the conversations were. I wasn't here as part of them, but that is baked into um, uh, CUNY for all faculty. The other thing that I think is worth noting is that, um, and this is something you might be familiar with, and I, I got to go back and look at a lot of stuff. Um, CUNY chain, the community colleges used to have um, different schedules for, you know, when tenure would come, and it was a shorter timeline, but there was a collective bargaining agreement about not quite 20 years ago where they, uh, to tenure, the timeline, and um, they doubled the, um, the number of reassigned time hours they gave for scholarly reassigned time. So there was this expectation that all faculty on tenure track lines would be doing, producing some kind of scholarship or creative work, depending on the field that you were in. So that that's my understanding that that's at a CUNY level. Now, how that plays out, it plays out in departmental PMBs in different ways, depending on the disciplines and you know the cultures of the departments, and then at the college. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I, I remember talking to Lily Shohat about this when she was either the chair or former chair of social science. And you're right that the my understanding was that they had extended the tenure calendar for everybody because, let's say, folks in the sciences needed a little bit more time with publishing. But when they uh, increased the amount of reassigned time for everybody as a result of, you know, they extended a, into a seven year, let's say, seven year calendar and they increased it, there was that expectation of greater scholarship. And I think I remember getting into it with Danny Lynch, our former chair of the chapter, about the fact that we could have probably used another year of reassigned time, uh, you know, that the reassigned time ideally would have finished at the point of which you were up for at least a tenure position. Because scholar, you know, you can't. You're, you're basically expecting people to do their last year of scholarship, which is usually what qualifies you for tenure, uh, without that reassigned time. You know, but that, well, one of the things, whole... yeah, one of the things they found so cycle of data collection involved use with um, a range of faculty who are at the um, full professor um, title. I did a survey with a, a kind of quant um, questions, but also short answer questions for folks who are assistant or associate um, faculty. And one of the things that I found out, really both of those sources, was that it was hard for faculty to understand how much reassigned time they had and when and how to use it. And right. several of the people I interviewed said they were kind of like, at the, in the they had all of this time they hadn't used and then they had to use it. So I think that's just another piece of this. We we do have something in the portfolio um, explicitly in, that would disappear for anyone who was viewing the published portfolio that, that talks about this piece about the reassigned time they have, how are they going to apply it, what other reassigned time might they be getting so they can just document and keep track of that as well. Well, you know, one of the things I learned, and I struggled with that as well, is I learned, you know, that the for LaGuardia, Kingsborough, and Gutman, the the one thing that's really helpful for full time faculty is the utilization of fall two. Yeah. What I call I call it the second summer, that really buys you two months where you could focus rather than teaching, you could focus on uh, again your scholarship. Uh, but I didn't find that out till again uh, on the back end. And you know, you, when you talked about all the areas that people are evaluated, you mentioned collegiality, and I always and I, f- I find that 
particular area fascinating because a lot of times in a report is a basically maybe a paragraph or something. Hugo is very collegial. He, you know, talks to everybody. What? And so after, of course, I had gotten my tenure and I became full, I started talking about, well, you know, I mean, Paul had brought up this I issue of leadership that had been maybe neglected for a period of time. What about this idea of collegiality? If we had people engaged in mentorship as a, as a kind of a way to measure collegiality, then we could, you know, this would be this way. Because I think that the things you're talking about uh, are things that, you know, a junior faculty member could could be learning from, you know, ideally it would be faculty have been here for a long time, but who are no longer um, going through this process. So, you know, if they want to be collegial, it's, you know, they're, it's because out of the goodness of their heart, let's say, as opposed well, to somebody who's going through this process. But mentorship, and I know that it exists in different departments, uh, but uh, well, it's me, something yeah, that Let me needed, jump in about right? that. Just a couple of things. One, uh, I was looking at, I also had from, for the interspens, again, they're, they're at full, they will probably, unless something comes up, never be evaluated again. And so I couldn't, you know, my own kind of, uh, influence on those interviews would have been very minimal. Um, I got to look at their promotion statements. I looked at promotion from assistant to, get to full, just to see how they framed these kinds of things. And even though it was usually, you said only a paragraph or something on their own collegiality, um, really reflecting on this, and this is supposed to be, by the way, in the voice of the chairs, uh, not not the right. not for the final promotion piece, but for the annual right. evaluations. Um, I, I started counting how many names were appearing in these documents, and one of my um, may have listed about forty-two colleagues in those ten pages. Yes. Uh, and that there's a kind of, oh, I wondered if that is one measure of collegiality, or at least from their perspective, like I've made all of these connections and the network that I've created here. There was a design team participants created that showed their connections across a range of projects and programs and the folks who were involved in those. And they could see like, oh, look at all of the depart academic departments that we have. It might be light on this department. Reason that I might not be working with someone in natural sciences if I'm in the humanities department, and is that a problem? It was just a way of visualizing that for someone. So I thought that was interesting. But I want to also jump to something else you said about mentorship. So, uh, you know, in a kind of academic manuscript, you you find you have your you know, we call them findings in, in qualitative. Um, and you want to place those within the literature. And, you know, my findings were really, one of them was around um, kind of guiding a mentoring practice for new faculty. Um, and, and to your point, it became clear that um, everyone's experiences were different. And sometimes it's at a departmental level, others um, connected. And that was something that seemed really important and powerful, I think, for faculty who have that, um, that mentoring relationship. The literature also shows, however, that um, there can be an equity issue. You know, who's your mentor and what is the relationship between your, and your background, your racial background or ethnicity and mentoring you? Is that an organic thing that comes up or are you assigned a mentor? And how are the experiences different for those groups? The coach survey did surface differences for women and for faculty of color as well. So I just think that's something that you know, my research didn't pull that out, except I did include, I, I did an extra piece. Um, I included all of the results from the survey, which was not something I needed to use in my actual dissertation, because I think that you'll see that there were some things that surfaced based on including if someone served on department PMB or not in their responses to questions. So just a lot of different ways you could break that down. I mean, it's interesting when you were talking, uh, I remember writing some of these reports yeah. and a lot of times I was told you're putting too many names in there because my goal was to show, 
you know, how I was working with as many people as possible. And I, you know, a goal, an ideal goal was to work with every department possible. Uh, but in many, a lot of times it was, yeah. I was discouraged from doing it because people were saying, well, it does, you know, make it sound like you did these things. You can't, if you, if you're giving all these credits, all these people, <laughs> not to mention it makes it phenomenally long. It makes for a very long document. But so what, so, so if you had, if you're a new faculty member, or say you're in your third year, and someone says, don't include all of these names because of this reason, and someone else suggests, I think you should include these names for this, like, what do you do with that? I, I think that's what anyone in, in times you have to balance these things. What kind of, who's doing the mentoring? How do they understand the issue? And does that change? If it's, you know, there are probably some people on your PMB who are that and then others who have a different opinion. So I just think it's a hard thing to some guidance. Well, in the end, you're supposed to depend upon the chair. And I can't speak to PMB because I was never elected to that body, but I've always felt that, I mean, I don't know what happens in those meetings, but that, again, the the folks who participate in it would ideally be given a cohort to help, particularly in the period when we had so many people going through tenure and promotion, to help them like with exactly what you're talking about, is about writing these things, giving them the feedback. Because, you know, I mean, hanging around with chairs uh, and whatever they could share, you know, one of the things you pick up quickly is there is a group that doesn't write enough, and then there's a group that writes too much, and then, you know, there's the body in the middle. But those folks who... Uh, you know, need things to say, need need that kind of support. By the by the way, we're coming up at the half hour mark, so I'd just like to say that uh, you're watching uh, what's going on here on LaGuardia Web Radio WLGR. I'm the host Hugo Fernandez, and uh, today my guest is. Uh, well, I'm going to pull this up right. Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Dr. Eric Hoffman. And we're discussing the completion of his dissertation, which was entitled, Everyone is a Case Study, The Learning Foundation of Academic Careers in a Community College. And he earned his Doctor of Education with a concentration on curriculum, teaching, learning, and leadership in the School of Education at Northeastern University. Um, so I'm going to say this, is the idea, and let's really talk about, let's, this, let's give this quarter hour here an opportunity to really talk about the tool you wanted to share uh, with faculty about what's available. Is this, do you see this device as being some sort of uh, a mentor uh, armature of some kind? I mean, do you, is this something that if people followed instructions could uh, move them through that process in the absence of a formal or even informal mentor relationship? Yeah, so I will, you know, it's a tool and it's a tool that uh, might help some people. So just to give you a little bit more context. Um, so we designed this tool and put in some prompts and we created um, kind of a prototype that two of the design team members then shared um, with chairs. I recruited current and former chairs to come to a, a demo around this tool and to give feedback on it. And one of the things that we learned from that, and when I was looking at the, the feedback and they completed a survey, was uh, the tool would work for everyone. Uh, um, there were recommendations from the chairs for faculty for whom they thought better. Um, and it wouldn't work maybe for faculty who seemed to be very self-directed, uh, organized, uh, under your faculty who'd been at LaGuardia for a while before they started the tenure track. Um, so the tool has limitations. And um, the piece then was, well, how would mentors and the chair use this if someone decided to use this tool? You know, this is just kind of something that, you know, you, you have your cell phone, it rings, you can answer it or not. So um, this would be folks who are interested in trying it out. Maybe they'll try it out. And it gives them a place to also share with a mentor if they want to. Here's what I'm doing. Here's how I'm framing this. Um, is there anything you see here from all of these documents I brought together that you can give me some feedback on in this way? So it just becomes some, like a talking point maybe for some of them where others might use it as you know, a digital diary, I believe someone on the design team called it. Um, someone else might shape 
that narrative by bringing all of this stuff together and someone could give feedback on that as well. I do think that mentoring is a big part of this, um, but ultimately, and I have this, this title um, that uses this uh, quote from one of the design team members, everyone is a case study. I'm, I'm playing around a little bit. Um, my, my background was like English lit and I like to um, kind of turn things um, on their head a little. So the methodology of action research is one methodology in qualitative research. Case study is another. And there's some, call it irony, that I would use the word case study uh, in an action research study. So uh, I, I learned in going through this that I, I think we all know this. Every, every faculty member is an individual learner. And you know, if they embrace that learner identity of coming to this community college, um, their path will have a different um, trajectory from anyone else. And so what we started was this idea of kind of scaffolding all seven years. You know, what do we put in year one and two? What should the prompts be in year five? But we realized as we were talking about it that it doesn't work that way. That you can have some prompts up there for thought about what year two might look like. The idea really is for each individual faculty member to kind of look at where they are and what their interests and goals are, and then they would build that out themselves. So we would give them this resource, but ultimately they would be adding to it. And with a mentor, it could be sort of guided or coached along how they might use that. So that was the idea for moving away from because I'm very much against templates in general. I just find them really hard. So moving away from something that was scripted over seven years to say, here's year one, just take some time here and reflect on it. And then to your point with a mentor, maybe you can decide what you're gonna do and you, and then we would give you, you know, you could pull a module in as you get to use and you, you familiarize yourself with this. For us, it's a digication e-portfolio because that's what we use here. Right, you know, Again, one of the things that you, when you were talking that, that, that I was thinking about was this idea that, and, and again, this is something you don't know till you're in it, in the process. I mean, most folks know that each time you write the report, which the chair uh, is going to present in the fall, typically, which is, this is now just about reappointment. It's basically encapsulating what happened over the last year. But when folks go up for associate, and then they go up for full professor eventually, what they have to encapsulate is the period for associate, obviously the period since they got there until the actual, and it happens in the spring of the year that they're, they're eligible, uh, what they did. And then when they go up for the full professorship, that they can only talk about everything that happened after the associate. And so, again, one of the things that people have to understand is that on those things were, of which you will be measured need to be happening in both periods of time. And yeah. not to mention, again, uh, if you're going up for full, you know, you could be looking back at three, four, and in some cases, you know, if someone waits uh, even more time, and it's hard, again, this finding all these materials uh, to, to make that, to, yeah. to make a case is always a problem, again. But you know, you had, so the question I never answered was about is LaGuardia sort of like your average college, community college. Um, you know, a lot of the literature about community colleges assumes that there is no scholarship. However, there's a, a, there is some recognition that in the Northeast especially, um, more of these institutions, community colleges, have that um, kind of baked into the expectations. I would also say that one of my... Um, interview participants uh, was very, uh, and, and they weren't the only one, I guess a couple of them, talked a lot about their scholarship, their research, uh, and how it was important for them as learners who are passionate about this work to bring that into the classroom as well and share that with their students so their students could understand that you know, they um, have their own kind of intellectual projects that they're engaged in. And so, you know, finding ways to integrate that was the other part of this portfolio that um, because you have all of these different categories, um, 
you know, how do you bring your scholarship into the classroom and connect that? How do you bring leadership in to connect with, say, advising? Um, someone talked about checking off a couple of boxes on that rubric <laughs> with one activity that could serve multiple purposes. And the reality is you're going to have to frame it that way. Um, so to the question, LaGuardia is in no way an average community college. And I don't mean that just because evaluated. Um, and I don't mean that just think it's a special place, even within CUNY. Um, I had the perspective from central office of uh, getting to know all of our CUNY campuses. Um, but there, it, it, there's just so much. It's our student body. It's the faculty. It's with the faculty, their experiences that they bring to this. And there is an ethos that um, is uniquely LaGuardia. And I wouldn't call it average in any way. Um, and if, it, if some people feel that's asking too much, I just wanted to point out that what faculty are asked to do, verify, a lot of that also comes from CUNY. And so how does it play out, though, at the departmental levels? Of the yeah, there's a lot of levels of interpretation. Uh, I, I would just point out that, you know, when you were when, when you were talking about faculty scholarship, I can speak from from the arts, from photography particularly, that students get a lot more excited when they find out they're working with a faculty member who does have a very active uh, exhibition and working career at the time. There are students are always interested in, you know, the kind of, the kinds of work you're doing that you're making for whatever reasons. I, I always joke and say, oh, you're just because you're going to try to imitate me <laughs> as a way to suck up to me. But, you know, I think it's just that they want to feel like they're working with somebody who's alive in the in the field as opposed to you know talk you know teaching you uh, from you know 20 years past or whatever 10 years gone whatever and you the role it. isn't only to be in the classroom but i do think that that in, for community colleges in general their their mission is it's a social justice mission and it is the primary um, component of that they did so for, for students to know that oh my professor is also doing this other thing i think that that creates a context that can be really helpful in the kind of engagement and the relationship that you have with the students it's another thing that came out of my first cycle of as i was coding those data how in, so i asked for recommendations um around you know kind of trying to like work be successful here however you define that and connecting i think what i heard from so many of the you know the interview participants was finding ways to connect your life as the as the professor to their lives and that might be broader and some people might have to make that um much broader but those kinds of connections are really important for i think our students their own engagement and we know how valuable the relationships they build with faculty are you know it's interesting because uh I'm teaching a lot of first year seminar courses now. And uh, I taught first, I taught the one for fine arts, which is a three credit. So there's a lot of, you know, the discipline is mixed into it and uh, as well as the information now. But I'm also teaching a one hour one, which is a pass fail model. And it's mostly about, you know, what are those key points that every student needs to know uh, when they first get here? and Inadvertent, I mean, uh, inevitably, I think the times that they, and then maybe this is my self delusion, but the times they seem most engaged are when I am talking about myself and my own experience with a particular issue. Uh, the abject lesson, I call myself, because <laughs> I identify with LaGuardia students, uh, uh, I identify with their experience, what they come from, their struggles. And so I use my own personal experience and you know, sometimes they, they, you know, when they find out, yeah, I still have student loans. I'm still paying student loans. I owe as much as I borrowed. Or it took me 13 years to get a six-year degree uh, that I flunked classes. All of these kinds of things because they think, you know, you're some sort of, uh, you know, paradigm of virtue up there that you did everything right and you don't really understand what they've been through. And I'll say, no, I was, yeah, I was, I was you. That's right. You know, I had to go to school when I was, you know, I had, I had jobs when I was in school. I stopped going to classes. I, and uh, so they, they, they seem to listen more. I don't know what they do with the information once they have it. That's the question. Yeah. 
you know. You can ask them. Yeah. Did I give your, your exit ticket? <laughs> well, this is the thing is that, uh, you know, watching, it'll be interesting to see what happens because I'm working with folks who are photo students, actually, and theater students as well. I define, I do, when I teach the fine arts one, I don't necessarily see them unless I see them in a survey course. So it's, I'm interested to see if these, if they stick it around, you know, what they took from that class, because, you know, they're, the, the, the case is still out on first year seminar. I know that people tell me the data shows the students who participate have success, but my argument is that anything a student does, <laughs> you know, is going to lead to success. Anything, I don't care if all we do is tie a kid's shoes when they walk into the building, you know, it's going to have an impact. They're going to feel cared for or whatever. I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know how to explain that phenomenon. But, uh, you know, that you, 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 I, I so want to do you Go know, right ahead. You, you want to, but you can't. No, I just, I mean, it's not really about this research. I think it's, um, we do our data that unpack what you're saying there a little bit. That, that, um, the data that we have on FYS is comparing comes for students who took it in their first semester at LaGuardia, including the short semester, or who versus those who did. They may have taken it in the second semester, um, or in the. So the comparison there is just um, across the disciplines, and there are differences. Um, some are zero credit, one hour with the faculty, one hour in the studio hour. Some are three hours with a faculty member each week. Um, they the, the retention rates are, we, we did an external evaluation on this, and strong um, positive uh, effects on retention that last over multiple semesters. So I think that that's what people are talking about when it's the, the data, like using some of that. Um, so yeah, so if you're if you're in a class and you're working with faculty and you have a peer mentor who is a student success mentor and you're kind of working on a portfolio and you're working with your advising team and there's co-curriculars, I mean, all of that is baked into these classes. So doing that in your first doing it later, you know, statistically it has shown um, a positive effect. And you're making friends that, you know, uh, I, I see that a lot of them have they've built relationships outside of the classroom and uh i was told years ago you know you make friends in college it's and you, you all tend to st stay in and finish uh but well, anyhow, hard, isn't it the hard part of a commuter college a commuter campus probably you know, the hardest finding, finding <laughs> ways finding ways to connect finding ways to fit it into your schedule i think that our our grand and experiment you know if there's this we know some of the, the some of the positives that we can take away from that. We also know that it doesn't work for everyone and we have to continue to around supports that our students need. So yeah, I think that that's, th this is what it means, you know, to come to a community college as a faculty member and really think more um, holistically about the experience of the students and how you contribute to that in the outside of it and how that connects to what you can and can't um, do and what you have the bandwidth for. I think that's a hard part too. So yes, mentorship would be important. Any tools that can help kind of understand what the expectations are, reflect on it, document some of that work. Um, you know, that I think if we, so ultimately we've got to help our faculty and help them feel that they're able to do the kinds of work that they want to and that they can meet the expectations um, because they're the ones who are spending the most time ultimately frame this around in what the literature uh, shows is it comes down to a faction that someone has in their job. And that's what the coach survey is about as well. So we're in the last quarter hour and uh, quarter of the hour. And there, I don't see any questions uh, on the Twitch stream. So uh, usually if we don't have questions, we talk about the future, and I think you had talked about, you know, making sure that uh, tell faculty about you want them to use this tool and how they can go about doing that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so working with um, this this design team of faculty and CTL folks, 
Um, one of the things we wanted to ask is if there were any faculty, like, you know, we have some faculty in their third or fourth year, but if they wanted to try this out uh, over the summer as they're thinking about um, their uh, paperwork that they're going to fill out um, for their evaluation. So if, if someone wants to kind of play around with this template, experiment with it, think about um, how it could apply to that write-up they have to do, uh, just send me an email and we can get you hooked up before you leave uh, June uh, to try this portfolio. So if you have familiarity with um, our digitization platform, uh, it'll be pretty easy, but you know, I can also Yeah, because again, I, I think about the fact that, I mean, people already, uh, you know, are gonna struggle with the, the actual writing of their work to have to tackle uh, figuring out a portfolio. I mean, I've, interestingly enough, <laughs> I've been working with ePortfolio. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't say since its inception, but since I came back, you know, to college uh, when I was uh, even before I was full time as an adjunct, I was working with. So I've I've been I've I've interacted with its many iterations, and I feel comfortable with the platform. Uh, comfortable enough to help students on occasion, though my SSMs or STMs have to hit me up when I struggle in a particular situation. But I, I think that, you know, that would be a, a concern for folks that they feel that, you know, if they have to deal with the with the platform as well, isn't this going to add another layer of struggle for them in their process? So if you were to help them, what does that mean? You're, you're, assigning, uh, you're assigning STMs that can assist them in their process? Some of it, I think, just the technical part about how do what what is this tool? There's we we have I think we even have some videos that can show them some of the basics for it. Um, so that would be the piece. I it, it better tool than it was six years ago. Um, this platform and it is uh, there's a lot where it's just fill out these these um, uh, maybe a response. So some prompts might show up that we created, and then they're just writing about. And then there's a way that they can link it to something else. So I keep, you know, I don't want to call it ePortfolio. It's my website because that's what all right. ePortfolio is. Um, yeah. But yeah, you have of this. Um, what's interesting is that we've got, um, we're, we're planning on bringing in a lot of um, new faculty on Lecture Alliance this fall. And they're going to have different uh, requirements as well. But I do believe that. Um, Many of them will, uh, in, in some some of the departments maybe, will be asked to. So if learning the tool is helpful for them that way because their students are using it, something else that they can consider. But volunteer, so if we can find volunteers who want to do this, we'll introduce it in new faculty colloquium on the side if someone wants to play around with it so they can do that thing that you were talking about starting to document stuff, you know, with this portfolio platform, you can drop um, all kinds of um, artifacts in there from Word documents to video, et cetera. Um, it, you know, it, it, what I find fascinating is that, uh, you know, I know that at the, at the college-wide PNBs, I don't know if it's happening in department PNBs, but they're basically looking at digital documents at this point. Everything is put into some sort of share drive. Uh, chairs are, are given iPads where they can review all the material. But what they're basically doing is we're still kind of taking a document that originally could have been typed or made on a press that it's been scanned in for them to look at. Meanwhile, as you said before, the ePortfolio tool affords all kinds of other things like video, right, audio. Uh, the, the visuals are better. I mean, I remember when I was going up for at some level, I had wanted to share a book that I had that of, of photographs, my Hemingway house book. And I was told, you know, the days of show and tell are no more. We're not allowed to bring in these, you know, these books to pass around. And I don't know whether it was some notion of an, unf you know, the, you know, how do certain disciplines compete against, you know, a discipline, which is, uh, visually, uh, you know, heavy or dependent or whatever it is. But I, you know, again, it's one of these, you know, 
uh, I would think, that, so for example, Lisa to Spain, who's one of our faculty and full professor and, you know, a star in her field, you know, if, if her opera, if you're going to listen to a few bars of her opera, what an impact that might have had in her own presentation. But uh, there seems, you know, there's a, like a disconnect. I don't get, I don't understand it. It did come up. Um, someone on the design team talked about the same thing and being told that, you know, it would preference certain kinds of right um, competencies, skill sets, and 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 I'm sure that there, you know, there are multiple perspectives on that. Um, I didn't get into that. I just tried to frame it around how does this tool help you get to that final. For me, it was my master's thesis. Um, I was on using these new internet technologies back in the day. Um, before Web 2.0 um, to teach composition, college composition classes. And I wrote my thesis as a website, uh, one of the first ones to do that. And I remember <laughs> going to the graduate school and you're supposed to have your, you know, thesis printed out with a one and a quarter inch margins and it had a have a certain cotton percentage and the paper, all of this, and it had to be delivered in this box. And I went and I had a box with a little floppy disk in it <laughs> to turn it into <laughs> pieces. And, and when it, we then had to give it to the library because they were supposed to bind and you know um, put these in the, the library. And I handed it to a librarian who said, this will be obsolete in two or three years. What am I supposed to do with this? And, you know, there was this whole, like, it was just this whole conversation that is like, it was ahead of where they were at the time, but they allowed me to do it. Um, and ultimately, my point about this was what my, my, what my thesis was, is how do you take all of those kind of hypertextual tools, the way that we think as we're being creative and then we're problem solving and we're bringing all this in and trying to synthesize it and then turn it into, you know, what people would call the five paragraph essay that I mean that we were beyond that but how do you take it all and then create a cohesive narrative for whatever the argument is that you're trying to make so and that's what I think this I think about this tool that way as well that it can help create the thing that they're asking you to produce by the time you're going up for full by the way I wanted to say this all uh, through the whole interview that you have a very artsy background with uh, the, in Edward Hopper over your right shoulder there. I know that that one, one of my favorite paintings of his. Then that that uh, hand, that hand so you up can there. See hand. I can't see it I anymore. See, I can see the hand. Uh, I don't know what that, yeah. And the picture on the right, oh my gosh, look at that. I thought it was like one of those, I don't know what it was, like the old glove mannequin things, whatever they had. It was a mold for um, rubber gloves, like kitchen 40s. Uh, uh, guy I worked with at Georgetown, um, he was an historian and, and he was looking at um, comics from era and one of his faculty members gave him this as an art effect from that That's time. And I see the, also the picture there. This I don't picture? know what the picture is. No, the other one. This? Oh, the shell? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I can't, again, I can't see it on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and interestingly enough, your shades create this kind of gorgeous blue right yeah I tell, exactly i was actually thinking of hopper too like hopper's skies on a light yeah anyhow uh we're almost out of time what what last things would you like to say um thank you uh also just i i, I just uploaded my dissertation in ProQuest yesterday so i have acknowledgments in there but i i was really really grateful for the time that all of the participants gave from you know completing of doing interviews to um, working really last fall on creating this tool and sharing their insight for the chairs who came and the former chairs who came to the demo. Um, I know how busy everyone is. And so it just, it felt like um, it was just great to have that energy and to learn um, from all of those unique perspectives. Um, so just if, if you're out there, uh, I thank you for, for that. and. You know, I've got a manuscript coming out in a book um, on action research in higher ed uh, uh, this coming fall, I think, is the publication date for that. And I hope really to promote the, 
the really important role of um, faculty at the community college. Um, we'll see. We'll see if it gets any traction. We'll have you back on for the, to talk about the book. <laughs> Thanks. OK, so uh, folks, uh, you've been watching the show. What's going on here on LaGuardia Web Radio, WLGR? And my guest today has been Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Dr. Eric Hoffman, who has been talking about his com the completion of his dissertation entitled Everyone is a Case Study, The Learning Foundation of Academic Careers in a Community College, Earning a Doctor of Education with a Concentration in Curriculum, Teaching, Learning, and Leadership in the School of Education at Northeastern University. Thanks for being on, and uh, will I see you at graduation? Yeah, you will. <laughs> I hope to see a lot of other folks at graduation as well. Yeah, looking forward to it. Okay, Mr. Pope, take us out as we started the show with a little more CSN. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Bye.